Chapters 31, 32, and 33 of The Moon and Sixpence. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barry Eads. The Moon and Sixpence by William Somerset Maugham. Chapter 31. Next day, though I pressed him to remain, Struve left me. I offered to fetch his things from the studio, but he insisted on going himself. I think he hoped they had not thought of getting them together, so that he would have an opportunity of seeing his wife again, and perhaps inducing her to come back to him. But he found his traps waiting for him in the porter's lodge, and the concierge told him that Blanche had gone out. I do not think he resisted the temptation of giving her an account of his troubles. I found that he was telling them to everyone he knew. He expected sympathy, but only excited ridicule. He bore himself most unbecomingly. Knowing at what time his wife did her shopping, one day, unable any longer to bear not seeing her, he waylaid her in the street. She would not speak to him, but he insisted on speaking to her. He spluttered out words of apology for any wrong he had committed towards her. He told her he loved her devotedly, and begged her to return to him. She would not answer. She walked hurriedly, with averted face. I imagined him with his fat little legs trying to keep up with her. Panting a little in his haste, he told her how miserable he was. He besought her to have mercy on him. He promised, if she would forgive him, to do everything she wanted. He offered to take her for a journey. He told her that Strickland would soon tire of her. When he repeated to me the whole sordid little scene, I was outraged. He had shown neither sense nor dignity. He had omitted nothing that could make his wife despise him. There is no cruelty greater than a woman's to a man who loves her and whom she does not love. She has no kindness then, no tolerance even. She has only an insane irritation. Blanche Strew stopped suddenly, and as hard as she could slapped her husband's face. She took advantage of his confusion to escape, and ran up the stairs to the studio. No word had passed her lips. When he told me this he put his hand to his cheek as though he still felt the smart of the blow, and in his eyes was a pain that was heart-rending, and an amazement that was ludicrous. He looked like an overblown schoolboy, and though I felt sorry for him, I could hardly help laughing. Then he took to walking along the street, which she must pass through to get to the shops, and he would stand at the corner on the other side as she went along. He dared not speak to her again, but sought to put into his round eyes the appeal that was in his heart. I suppose he had some idea that the sight of his misery would touch her. She never made the smallest sign that she saw him. She never even changed the hour of her errands, or sought an alternative route. I have an idea that there was some cruelty in her indifference. Perhaps she got enjoyment out of the torture she inflicted. I wondered why she hated him so much. I begged Struve to behave more wisely. His want of spirit was exasperating. "'You're doing no good at all by going on like this,' I said. "'I think you'd have been wiser if you'd hit her over the head with a stick. She wouldn't have despised you as she does now.' I suggested that he should go home for a while. He had often spoken to me of the silent town, somewhere up in the north of Holland, where his parents still lived. They were poor people. His father was a carpenter, and they dwelt in a little old red-brick house, neat and clean, by the side of a sluggish canal. The streets were wide and empty. For two hundred years the place had been dying, but the houses had the homely stateliness of their time. Rich merchants, sending their wares to the distant Indies, had lived in them calm and prosperous lives, and in their decent decay they kept still an aroma of their splendid past. You could wander along the canal till you came to broad green fields, with windmills here and there, in which cattle, black and white, grazed lazily. I thought that among those surroundings, with their recollections of his boyhood, Dirk Struve would forget his unhappiness. But he would not go. I must be here when she needs me, he repeated. It would be dreadful if something terrible happened and I were not at hand. What do you think is going to happen? I asked. I don't know, but I'm afraid. I shrugged my shoulders. 
For all his pain, Dirk Struve remained a ridiculous object. He might have excited sympathy if he had grown worn and thin. He did nothing of the kind. He remained fat, and his round red cheeks shone like ripe apples. He had great neatness of person, and he continued to wear his spruce black coat and his bowler hat, always a little too small for him, in a dapper, jaunty manner. He was getting something of a paunch, and sorrow had no effect on it. He looked more than ever like a prosperous bagman. It is hard that a man's exterior should tally so little sometimes with his soul. Dirk Struve had the passion of Romeo in the body of Sir Toby Belch. He had a sweet and generous nature, and yet was always blundering. A real feeling for what was beautiful, and the capacity to create only what was commonplace. A peculiar delicacy of sentiment and gross manners. He could exercise tact when dealing with the affairs of others, but none when dealing with his own. What a cruel practical joke old nature played when she flung so many contradictory elements together, and left the man face to face with the perplexing callousness of the universe. So ends Chapter 31 Chapter 32 I did not see Strickland for several weeks. I was disgusted with him, and if I had had an opportunity, should have been glad to tell him so but I saw no object in seeking him out for the purpose. I am a little shy of any assumption of moral indignation. There is always in it an element of self-satisfaction which makes it awkward to anyone who has a sense of humor. It requires a very lively passion to steal me to my own ridicule. There was a sardonic sincerity in Strickland which made me sensitive to anything that might suggest a pose. But one evening, when I was passing along the Avenue de Clichy, in front of the café which Strickland frequented, and which I now avoided, I ran straight into him. He was accompanied by Blanche Struve, and they were just going to Strickland's favorite corner. "'Where the devil have you been all this time?' said he. "'I thought you must be away.' His cordiality was proof that he knew I had no wish to speak to him. He was not a man with whom it was worth while wasting politeness. No. I said, I haven't been away. Why haven't you been here? There are more cafés in Paris than one, at which to trifle away an idle hour. Blanche then held out her hand and bade me good evening. I did not know why I had expected her to be somehow changed. She wore the same grey dress that she wore so often, neat and becoming, and her brow was as candid, her eyes as untroubled, as when I had been used to see her occupied with her household duties in the studio. "'Come and have a game of chess,' said Strickland. I do not know why at the moment I could think of no excuse. I followed them, rather sulkily, to the table at which Strickland always sat, and he called for the board and the chessmen. They both took the situation so much as a matter of course that I felt it absurd to do otherwise. Mrs. Struve watched the game with inscrutable face. She was silent, but she had always been silent. I looked at her mouth for an expression that could give me a clue to what she felt. I watched her eyes for some tell-tale flash, some hint of dismay or bitterness. I scanned her brow for any passing line that might indicate a settling emotion. Her face was a mask that told nothing. Her hands lay on her lap motionless, one and the other loosely clasped. I knew from what I had heard that she was a woman of violent passions, and that injurious blow that she had given Dirk, the man who had loved her so devotedly, betrayed a sudden temper and horrid cruelty. She had abandoned the safe shelter of her husband's protection and the comfortable ease of a well-provided establishment for what she could not but see was an extreme hazard. It showed an eagerness for adventure, a readiness for the hand-to-mouth, which the care she took of her home and her love of good housewifery made not a little remarkable. She must be a woman of complicated character, and there was something dramatic in the contrast of that with her demure appearance. I was excited by the encounter, and my fancy worked busily while I sought to concentrate myself on the game I was playing. I always tried my best to beat Strickland, because he was a player who despised the opponent he vanquished. His exultation in victory made defeat more difficult to bear. On the other hand, if he was beaten, he took it with complete good humor. 
He was a bad winner and a good loser. Those who think that a man betrays his character nowhere more clearly than when he is playing a game might on this draw subtle inferences. When he had finished, I called the waiter to pay for the drinks and left them. The meeting had been devoid of incident. No word had been said to give me anything to think about, and any surmises I might make were unwarranted. I was intrigued. I could not tell how they were getting on. I would have given much to be a disembodied spirit, so that I could see them in the privacy of the studio, and hear what they talked about. I had not the smallest indication on which to let my imagination work. So ends Chapter 32 Chapter 33 Two or three days later, Dirk Strove called on me. I hear you've seen Blanche, he said. How on earth did you find out? I was told by someone who saw you sitting with him. Why didn't you tell me? I thought it would only pain you. What do I care if it does? You must know that I want to hear the smallest thing about her. I waited for him to ask me questions. What does she look like? he said. Absolutely unchanged. Does she seem happy? I shrugged my shoulders. How can I tell? We were in a cafe. We were playing chess. I had no opportunity to speak to her. Oh, couldn't you tell by her face? I shook my head. I could only repeat that by no word, by no hinted gesture, had she given me an indication of her feelings. He must know better than I how great were her powers of self-control. He clasped his hands emotionally. Oh, I'm so frightened. I know something is going to happen, something terrible, and I can do nothing to stop it. What sort of thing? I asked. Oh, I don't know he moaned, seizing his head with his hands. I foresee some terrible catastrophe. Struve had always been excitable, but now he was beside himself. There was no reasoning with him. I thought it probable enough that Blanche Struve would not continue to find life with Strickland tolerable, but one of the falsest of proverbs is that you must lie on the bed that you have made. The experience of life shows that people are constantly doing things which must lead to disaster and yet by some chance managed to evade the result of their folly. When Blanche quarreled with Strickland, she had only to leave him, and her husband was waiting humbly to forgive and forget. I was not prepared to feel any great sympathy for her. You see, you don't love her, said Struve. After all, there's nothing to prove she is unhappy. For all we know, they may have settled down into a most domestic couple. Struve gave me a look with his woeful eyes. Of course it doesn't much matter to you, but to me it's so serious, so intensely serious. I was sorry if I had seemed impatient or flippant. Will you do something for me? asked Struve. Willingly. Will you write to Blanche for me? Why can't you write yourself? I've written over and over again. I didn't expect her to answer. I don't think she reads the letters. You make no account of feminine curiosity. Do you think she could resist? She could. Mine. I looked at him quickly. He lowered his eyes. That answer of his seemed to me strangely humiliating. He was conscious that she regarded him with an indifference so profound that the sight of his handwriting would have not the slightest effect on her. Do you really believe that she'll ever come back to you? I asked. I want her to know that if the worst comes to the worst she can count on me. That's what I want you to tell her. I took a sheet of paper. What is it exactly you wish me to say? This is what I wrote. Dear Mrs. Struve, Dirk wishes me to tell you that if at any time you want him, he will be grateful for the opportunity of being of service to you. He has no ill feeling towards you on account of anything that has happened. His love for you is unaltered. You will always find him at the following address. So ends chapter 33.